Okay, let's look at digital certificates. So, uh, in, as part of this lecture, we'll have a look at some authentication methods and then on to PKI, which is public key infrastructure, especially looking at what a certificate uh, contains and it's how it's used. And then finally, we'll look at some digital certificate uh, passing. So, when we connect to a website, what we want to see if it's properly identified is, is a is a digital certificate which proves the identity of the site. So that proof comes from Trent signing the certificate. Once it's uh, using something like HTTPS, then uh, we also use that to keep the communication secure or private. Okay, so what does PKI mean and what do we know in terms of trust on the internet? Well, currently uh, Google are pushing the usage of HTTPS and they're doing that by saying that any site which is not uh, HTTPS will be marked as insecure. So this is my site here and we see here it has HTTPS on it and it should be HTTPS by default. Unfortunately, uh, Many sites on the internet still are untrustworthy. This is the Greater Manchester Police one, North Hans Police, Hertz, Derbyshire, and other sites, all which do not have a digital certificate on them which properly identifies the, the site so the user has no idea if this is a spoof site or, or not and it gets a whole lot more worrying when we see a site such as this and then we realize that uh, this site here has given information uh, security information and it's not even been signed and then when someone is reporting a crime then they're posting it into a site which has not been properly secured or identified so increasingly what we'll see is that anything that we post especially for financial information should be protected by uh, a, a, or identified properly by a digital certificate and protected by HTTPS and this is the kind of thing that we might see. So this is a completely spoofed uh, web page. Okay, so our focus really uh, is upon authenticating our servers and our systems. We then keep confidentiality through encryption and then we have some sort of integrity. And as we see in this unit, uh, the three bind together very well. So our challenge is how we get the public key from Bob to Alice so that Eve doesn't spoof that public key in some way. And then how can uh, Alice tell that uh, her message hasn't been tampered with by Eve? So the public key passing is, is important for Bob to Alice. And then how do we trust, uh, who do we trust to identify Bob and in this case, we'll find that both Bob and Alice trust Trent to be able to identify each other. So what is it we're trying to identify? Well, there's many things. There's users, user identities and pseudonyms and so on. There's devices, systems and data, all of which need to be authenticated properly. And increasingly, we need to identify them. But we can get what's called uh, intermediate authentication and something like HTTPS really focuses on this device to server communications where we tunnel uh, secure data through the network. But the problem is, is that on either end here, then it's insecure. So increasingly what we see is end-to-end -end authentication where the user is authenticating themselves to the end service. And then we can get different ways of authenticating. The one way server authentication is what we see in HTTPS, where the server sends a digital certificate to the user 
and that identifies the server. We can also do it the other way. We can have a one-way authentication of the user or the device to the server. That's used in Eep TLS that we see in, in wireless. And then, if we really want to make sure that either side is correct, we'll have mutual authentication. And methods such as PEEP, we can do that, where we can pass IDs between the two parties and for them to agree. So obviously mutual authentication is the best, but it takes a little bit more in setting up. But for HTTPS, this is the method that we actually use. The user never authenticates themselves through a certificate. So the different ways that we can do it, we can obviously identify the user or devices and so on. We can use MAC addresses and fingerprints and passphrases and so on, each with their own level of distinctiveness and usability uh, from in there. And we often define that, uh, well, that we have different authentication uh, attributes. Uh, that's something that you are, something that you have, and something that you know. We can also add a fourth one in, somewhere you are, is, 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 a, is a good attribute for defining uh, identity. So in something you know, it's typically a username or a PIN number. Something you are is typically your biometrics, such as your retina scan or your iris scan, your palm prints or your fingerprints. And then something that you have is something like a digital certificate, MAC address, or a smart card. Okay, so we need a way to pass the public key to Alice. And the one way that we do that is with a digital certificate. So here are some of the details that we see with inside our digital certificate. Uh, we have a thumbprint, uh, which is typically an MD5 or a SHA. Uh, 256 SHA-1 uh, hash signature to prove that the um, the certificate hasn't been changed. Then we have a public key, in this case 2048 bits RSA. And then we have the issuer, who is Trent for the certificate. And the two different certificates that we often have are ones that have both the public and the private key. We'll see the little key there. And then we have an export of that that gives us only a, a certificate with a public key. We need to make sure that this certificate is never actually released and that we have some protection on what we define as the key pair, the two keys that go together. It's the public key which is used to be able to prove the identity of the entity. So the different formats that we have is that typically a, a certificate is distributed in a in a, a base 64 format, this is called the P7B format, and then is imported into the system and is added on to our trusted certificates. The different formats that we have is this: this is the P7B format. We can also have PFX, P12 format, which is binary and has a password associated with it. That's the format that we typically use for storing uh, key pairs. On, on a system. Okay, so the method that we have within public key is that uh, we might use uh, Alice's public key, private, our public key to encrypt and then her private key to decrypt. But where certificates are normally used is in, is in the signing process. So with this, uh, Bob creates a hash of the message or of a message and uses his private key to encrypt a hash signature. On the other side, Alice will use his public key to decrypt the hashed, uh, the hash of the message, the encrypted hash of the message, and Bob sends over his digital certificate to authenticate himself. Okay, so so how do we then? How do we trust? Trent, who do we trust and how is that trust infrastructure set up? Well, with PKI, what we have is a trusted root CA or a certificate authority. That's the top level certificate authority, such as VeriSign, Entrust, and Microsoft Trust. They then issue, they check Bob's uh, identity and issue him with a, a key pair, a certificate. Then uh, Trent. Uh, installs a trusted root on Alice's computer, which 
uh, contains the public key of uh, Trent. This key, this certificate here, is signed by Trent, Trent's private key, so that when Bob passes the certificate over, then uh, Alice checks the validity of the certificate using Trent's public key. The last thing we want is for the Trusted Root Authority to lose its private key as anything that's been signed by that uh, will then be compromised. Unfortunately, Eve might trick the Trusted Root to give her a certificate and then trick Alice into installing the certificate or trusting it. So we have different levels. Uh, we have a trusted root, which are always trusted. That's the top level. We need to watch that no uh, no certificates are installed into this area, which are not trusted, because they can then verify untrusted applications. Then below that, we have intermediate CAs, which can be trusted for certain things like secure email, code signing, uh, IP tunneling, and encrypted file systems. And then uh, we have a self-signed certificate, which really can't be trusted uh, at all. You can see the issuer is the same as issued by. So let's have a look at a few different certificates and see if we can work out if they're valid or not. So this one is here, issued by VeriSign, class 3. And there, if we forget the, the validity of the date there, let's have a look at the trust levels. And it goes all the way up to VeriSign. So this is a valid certificate. If we look at this one, this is self-signed, so it's fake. And what we'll get is a message such as this, which will say, if, do we want to import the certificate? For this one here, the problem with this one is that it's issued to a whole domain, so we must worry about that. But actually, it's valid uh, because it says it goes right up to global sign, so there's a trust path there. So let's go through a, a basic uh, setup uh, using public key and also by signing. Okay, the normal the way that HTTPS works is only the signing part is going to be used. But we'll talk through what how public key would work in its purest form. So initially, what we have to do is to get Alice's public key. Uh, that's sent over with the digital certificate. Uh, next, Bob creates the message and then creates a signature of the message, like a hash signature. He then encrypts that signature with his private key and then could use Alice's public key to encrypt the whole message. He sends that over and then Alice will now use which key? Yeah, the private key to be able to uh, decrypt the uh, message here from her certificate. The certificate has both the key pair on it there. So she decrypts that and she ends up and reads the message and she has an encrypted hash here. So the key she'll use to be able to unencrypt that will be Bob's public key. So Bob passes along his digital certificate and she unencrypts that and then we'll check the hash of the message against the hash that Bob's given her and that will prove both the validity of the message, that it hasn't been changed, and also uh, Bob's identity for the message. Okay, so she's proven Bob was the creator of the message. Bob uh, has passed over his, pr his public key uh, with a distributable certificate. So let's talk through that again. So Bob takes a message, then takes uh, an encrypted hash with his private key, sends it over. Uh, Alice uses her, uh, Bob uses Alice's public key to be able to encrypt it, sends it over. She uses her private key to decrypt, and then will decrypt the encrypted hash and check it with the hash that she gets. And she's validated the, the message. Okay, how it really works uh, looks like this, if you're interested. Uh, basically what happens is that public key is too intense for uh, processor intensive for encrypting large messages. So what we often do is to be able to use a session key. 
We use a session key for the encryption for encrypting mail. This is PGP. And then we use Alice's public key to encrypt that encryption key. The whole process works kind of the same, but when Alice receives it, she decrypts the session key with her private key. And then uh, we use uh, this symmetric key encryption to be able to decrypt the message. Okay, so that's been a quick overview of digital certificates.